I'm going to talk to you just for starters for a few minutes about some of the work that we've done about um, the prevalence of medical debt uh, to sort of set the stage and, and hopefully make the case to you all uh, about how much bigger a problem this is than, than you may even realize. So I'm going to start actually by reintroducing you to Sherry Foy, who was one of the women who was featured in those wonderful videos yesterday. Sherry, who's seated here, lives in southwestern Virginia with her husband, Michael, there, who spent his career working for Con Ed up in New York. And just to give you a little bit more background of the, the kinds of stories that we've essentially been living with um, reporting this story, Sherry um, uh, and her husband moved to southwestern Virginia from New York about 10 years ago when he was able to take early retirement. They had saved up a nest egg. He had a retirement health plan. They thought they were in pretty good shape. And then in 2016, um, Sherry had to have her colon removed. Um, she had essentially had, I guess, undiagnosed ulcerative colitis for many years. She had an infection that landed her in the hospital for weeks. And when she came out, she was left with $800,000 in medical bills, part that were not covered by her health insurance. And I think one thing that's important to understand about medical debt is this is not just an issue of people having trouble affording their care. It is what happens to them when they cannot afford their care. Because not only could Sherry not pay these bills, but the hospital then sued her. The University of Virginia, the public system in Virginia, sued her. She and her husband were forced to cash in a life insurance policy to pay for the lawyer to handle this and her subsequent bankruptcy filing. And they were then forced to liquidate the savings accounts that they had set up for their grandchildren. It obviously should not come as a surprise that this is a woman who doesn't particularly trust the healthcare system. And she's really one of hundreds of people that we have interviewed over the last couple of years in reporting on this project. And as I said earlier, it's no secret that medical debt is a problem. It is bigger than we realize. A hundred million people in this country have some form of healthcare debt. And the reason for that is that because traditionally when, me when medical debt has been uh, uh, measured, it has been measured as a share of the people who have some kind of unpaid medical bill on their credit score. And that significantly undercounts how many people out there have been forced into debt by the healthcare system. It doesn't count, as our poll does, it doesn't count the people who put their bills on their credit cards and then can't pay their credit cards off. It doesn't count the millions of people who go on payment plans from, with hospitals and other providers where they're stuck paying for years the bills that they couldn't afford. And it doesn't count, importantly, the people who have been forced to borrow money from friends and family under terms that we don't even know. So number one, this is a bigger problem than, than we understand. It's a problem that's concentrated in certain parts of the country, the South primarily, for reasons that I'm sure will not surprise any of you. It's a problem that affects the sick more than the well. Parents are more than twice as likely as non-parents to have medical debt. Think about that. Young people are more likely than old people to have medical debt. Black Americans are about 50% more likely than white Americans to have it. And the impact this is having, I think, is something that most people don't understand. More than half the people in this country in our poll who have health care debt have said that they had to make some kind of a difficult sacrifice as a result of this. Almost two-thirds said they had to cut back on food, clothing, other essentials. One in five have been forced to change their living situation. And I think this is one of the most chilling statistics, particularly for maybe this audience. One in seven say they have been denied medical care because of money that they owe. Lastly, and then I'll, I'll wrap up the numbers. This impacts trust, as, as undoubtedly it would. You can see here, this was a question we asked of people who, how much trust do you have in medical providers to have your best interest in mind? As you can see, people who have medical debt, 40%, only 40% of them do not have trust compared to 27% who do. So, I'll wrap up there with the, the overall statistics. I was encouraged to hear earlier that folks were interested in, in understanding kind of the impact that medical debt is having. And I'll just before turning it over to Don, I, I want to make one kind of analogy and that 
kind of came to my mind as I was thinking about the conversations that we've had over the last two days. And one is, and, and, and it, 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 I don't know if this is a perfect analogy, but I was thinking about if I call a plumber to come to my house and fix my, leak, my, my, my plugged kitchen sink, and that plumber shows up on time and he's well-dressed and he listens to me explain the problem and he, and he, and he gets in there and he solves my, my, my leak and he even corrects some of my misperceptions about whether I should pour the oil down the kitchen sink or not, I'd probably give him five stars when he leaves. But if he sent me a $2,000 bill afterwards, do you think I would remember any of that other stuff that he had done for me? I don't think he would. And I think one thing that, that's really struck, stuck with me as we've been interviewing these patients around the country is how angry and disillusioned people are who get these bills and get pursued by the healthcare system that's supposed to take care of them. Um, well, I, I guess I want to apologize at the start uh, because I'm now going to take us with, into a much wider frame than the medical debt problem. But I think the right thing for this group to do and that Daniel would have us do is to then narrow the frame when I'm done back to the issue that um, Noam has uh, focused us on. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the ABIM uh, Foundation for this um, remarkable meeting. It's the best meeting of the year for me, no, no question, not even, nothing else is even close. Um, and also, it's a pleasure to be here with Noam on the platform. Noam um, it has perfect pitch as a journalist, in my view. He is, I, I've told him, uh, uh, I think he's the best medical journalist we have, frankly. Uh, I hope Joanne's not in the room. <laughs> 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 yeah, second best. I, I, I mean. um, Norm has a way to, to uh, uh, bring a story home about something we really care about, and, and, and he cares about it too. But, uh, or and, w w what Norm's focusing on, I want to uh, have us rethink for a moment in a wider frame as a manifestation and instantiation of a much larger. Uh, problem. Uh, I think one of the Buddhist or noble truth is everything is caused. This is caused. And um, I think and, uh, an inquiry about what the causal system is, is important. Uh, it is also important to note, and no one correct me if I'm wrong, this is the only country in which you could make these remarks. Is that right? I mean, other only countries don't even country. measure this. No, other countries don't even measure it. So, so, um, but, Anyone that says, oh, it's inevitable, you know, in a technocratic, successful medical system, people are going to have debt. No, it's not true. We, we are unique. So um, there are causes here that are apparently not at work uh, anywhere else. And this debt is not inevitable. Um, the, the structural causes for it are many, and we could spend the whole afternoon and tomorrow uh, and not get done examining the whole nexus of causes. Um, one of which, by the way, I think is that no one is responsible. If you said who is responsible for ending this travesty, no one would raise their hand, including the President of the United States. Um, now, I have focused recently on one cause, and I want to say it's only one. It may not even be the main cause, but as many of you know, I wrote an article in JAMA based in, in a speech I gave at last year's IHI National Forum on greed. Uh, the article is called Salve Lucrum, which is uh, a phrase I saw on a mosaic floor when I visited Pompeii last year uh, in the home of what someone that must have been a wealthy merchant. Salve Lucrum means welcome prophet, hail prophet. Um, and this article and my continuing thinking about it, and my, I'll, 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 be, I'll be clear, my, my, my something approaching rage about, and I'm really angry about this. Uh, is that we have allowed in this country uh, greed to become a pervasive characteristic of the way the healthcare system operates. Um, many other words I could have chosen, I'll get to that in a few minutes, uh, but it's the Im immoderate pursuit of profit. It's the unrestrained uh, pursuit of financial self-interest. I personally believe this is, there's no, I can't think of a sector of American healthcare that is um, immune to this um, uh, this affliction. Uh, certainly, the the ones everyone would mention first: pharma companies, uh, unrestrained pricing, uh, able to 
take monopolistic uh, structures and price as high as they want, um, and they do it. Um, that even applies now to generics because we have a flawed uh, patent system that allows uh, companies to get control of generic products and price them any way they want. Now, that's, they would say not any way they want. There are eventually some limit is reached, but the limit is obscene and, by the way, not characteristic of any other country. Um, the uh, insurance industry is another uh, common example. I've been studying it now for two years with Rick Gilfillan, and the behaviors are unconscionable, uh, exploitative. Uh, I particularly believe that's true in the Medicare Advantage world, where uh, restraint has not applied. I absolutely am a fan of managed care. I think we need mechanisms to get people into global budgets and at-risk situations. But what the insurance industry does and continues to do uh, is, is beyond moderation, I think beyond conscience. Um, hospitals are not immune at all. Uh, the behaviors of, uh, was the University of Virginia, Virginia, was it? I mean, it's, it's part of the nexus of hospital behaviors uh, around uh, mergers and acquisitions, growth of uh, market power and presence, pricing games. Uh, I certainly see that in my own state, Massachusetts, where the premier um, uh, hospital system will not take responsibility for reducing costs uh, substantially uh, in the Commonwealth. They're too important to take responsibility for that. Um, physicians are by no means immune. Uh, physician groups have uh, taken advantage of, uh, again, problems in our coding systems and uh, um, uh, uh, ways, ways to game. Um, if you get on the American Medical Association website, I think on page one, you will see a celebration of the successes of the AMA of the past year. Number one, protecting physician incomes. Number two, blocking expansion of scopes of practice among non-physicians. That's our leading guilt. Um, now, the effects of all of this, Noam has documented in terms of debt. Um, again, it's not the only cause of debt, but I think it, I think it plays there. There are effects on patients and families. Um, the rise in premiums in Massachusetts now is such that it now caught, it, it, someone is paying more for the average premium for a family of four in Massachusetts than it costs to buy a car. Um, and the, ri the rate of rise continues to be a multiple of the rate of inflation in the economy. Uh, clinicians pay a terrible price in moral injury and... Uh, and dystonic, uh, or whatever the psychiatric word is, where they're, what they are for, what they have to do is dissonant with what they came into this world to do. Think of those four students and how, how much beauty we have available to us and the motivation of the workforce. But physicians now become uh, complicit in the, the gaming that the cascade of effects uh, that um, result from the pursuit of. Uh, profit and income. And of course, the non-physician employees, the more silent, larger group, uh, are um, affected by this. They are not being fee treated fairly, especially in uh, home health care and other kind of mar more marginal parts of the system as the way we treat them. And I can't imagine they can watch the behaviors of a corporation, of a corporate America, corporate American medicine, and feel anything but uh, I don't know, angry maybe? I don't know what they would feel. But what, when you watch the CEO of United Healthcare get paid $30 million this year, or the CEO of an academic medical center get paid uh, multiple millions, and you're working for a bit above minimum wage in that same organization to help people, what must you feel? Um, I have to admit, I've coming around to believing that the basic underlying flaw is um, profit in medicine. Uh, I, think, uh, I think a form of misinformation in the American social system is that profit drives excellence. If you've read Naomi Oreskes' book uh, just out a couple months ago, she is uh, taking a historian's look at what appears to be a myth, the Chicago School 
view that this is the way to drive excellence, but that's a bigger topic. Um, I want to say about the salary story, um, it's only symbolic. You could, you could reduce the salaries of every multi-million dollar paid uh, executive in American healthcare to, to a mere two million, let's say. Um, and you really wouldn't put a dent in the overall structure, but you would put a dent in the symbolism of self-restraint and humility, economy, uh, respect uh, in, our, in our system. Now, I've been, uh, a lot of people have been angry about the article I wrote, not a lot, I'm a lot don't even, most people don't even know about it, but among those who know about it, uh, I've been told and taken to the woodshed a bit by people saying, well, you're accusing me of being greedy. You know, who are you to cast? Uh, you know, I, 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 I'm quite wealthy. I'm, I live a very, very good life. Who are you to, to, to cast these aspersions? And greed is a personal attack. It means that my motivation isn't right or that uh, it's accusatory and it's very personal. Isn't it better to talk maybe about corporate profiteering or um, immoderation or something like that? And I really struggle with this because these are my friends, or my former friends, uh, that I'm talking about. I don't really know what to say. How to, how, I don't know what to say. I mean, it, it, it's wrong. It's just we're doing something wrong, I think, because it is a generator of the harm that, um, what was her name? Uh, Fer Sherry is feeling. That is caused. Um, so I've gone back to greed. It's, it's the only word I know, even though I know that it's us, it's all of us, it's my friends, and it's good people. Uh, a final comment is about the, the fix. So people say, well, Don, you know, you're, 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 you're criticizing. What, what are you going to do about it? What's your fix? Uh, m my fix is a shift of power. Uh, the, 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 the system that's maintaining this is, is uh, enforced through our government. Uh, the, the, the cycle is pretty clear. Greed, which we allow to operate in this country in ways not allowed in others, concentrates wealth because it works. Concentrated wealth in a country under Citizens United uh, concentrates access to the political decision-making process. And therefore, the processes you would use to restrain greed don't work because they're blocked by that political access. What should we do? I don't know. That's why we're here. You have until tomorrow morning to figure it out. Um, I, I feel an unknowing. I'd love to hear you say more about it. If the answer isn't in this room, I don't know where it is, because this is us. There's, there's, there isn't any other platform I can think of, um, uh, and the clock ticks. Real people get hurt, and I just am, I hope in whatever life I have left, uh, some force is going to take form. Uh, in, if it were in the 60s, it would be in the streets. Here, I don't know where it is where people say, enough, we're just gonna stop it. And I hope that we can somehow take responsibility.